Saturday Safari, where we're going to take a little time and sit around the table and do an in-depth study of a topic. Today's topic is going to be on modems, routers, and Wi-Fi's. We're pleased to have Dave, uh, Bill James with us today. Uh, during his presentation, if you have questions that you would like to have asked of him, you can use your uh, chat box and send those questions to Judy Tallur. Do not send them to Bill. He doesn't see them because he's doing the presentation and uh, she will ask them. If you have any problems with Zoom, you can text me in the chat box. I'll try to help you. Uh, otherwise, after Bill's done with his presentation, Judy will ask the questions. And then when we're all done with those questions, we'll open things up for our general uh, period of time to open the mic and discuss and ask other questions. Again, at this time, make sure that you've got your registration information correct so that you can get follow up. Bill James does not need a lot of introduction. He is at the Speakers Bureau for APCUG and has presented at a ton of many of your computer groups and he's been our, he's our normal co-host today. He's doing the job of presenter. Uh, he's from Oklahoma City and he loves Mustangs. He's the advisor for Region 8 and he's our go-to person for home uh, autom automotive, automotive, automation and, and uh, Windows. So today he's going to share his expertise on Wi-Fi's routers and modems. So Bill, take it over. Thanks, John. And good morning or afternoon, wherever you might be. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, the presentation that uh, we have today is quite long. So we will take some uh, breaks in the between so you can get any questions that you might have answered. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. And um, hopefully you find some um, benefit out of this presentation. Let's see. We're gonna start with the early days. In the early days of networking, the term modem was used to describe a device that transformed speech into analog signals and vice versa to be transmitted over telephone lines. Modems have been in use for teletype services since the 1920s. And we all know this in a telegram and cablegram via teletype, they used something that was called a serial RS-232 standard. And it was used for teletype machines which could communicate with each other over our phone lines. Each teletype would be physically connected to its modem, working on 110 bits per second via a RS-232 connector. And the modems could call each other to establish remote connections between teletypes. And one, what, uh, one type that a teletype or had saved on the punch uh, paper type could be printed on a remote teletype located far away. And there was no computer involved. There's a picture of some of the rather uh, complex machinery that was involved in this process. In the late 1950s, AT&T developed the first commercial mass-produced computer modems, then called a digital subset to link semi-automatic ground environment 
which they call SAGE computers across the United States. They also commuted at 110 bits per second. And since then, this term has been broadened to describe a variety of devices to perform modulation, demodulation, or encoding, decoding in its most fundamental sense. And to the right, you'll see a audio, what was called an audio coupler back in the days. And I remember still using those uh, in the, as early into, into the 70s. So um, we've advanced quite a bit since then. The most iconic aspect of the early days of the internet is probably a series of sounds, a dial-up modem speaking connection. It sounded something like, if I can uh, mimic that. But there's also a brilliant joke that you can go and watch. It was in a Muppet movie in 2012. And that was when a character named 80s Robot tried to connect to the internet and all the other Muppets couldn't stand it. And I have a link here where you can play that when you get this uh, uh, presentation. Internet worked over phone lines. However, when using the internet, it wasn't possible to call or receive. My mother would shout, are you doing interneting? I would like to make a call. I remember I had, uh, by that time I had moved out of my uh, parents' house and had one of my own. And I had, would tie up the phone lines with the internet and they would be trying calling me and they couldn't even, was, all they would get was a busy line which required me at some point to get a second phone line so I could have it dedicated to uh, just the modem. But if you recall, those early modems were really clunky affairs with the acoustic coupler I mentioned earlier and the need to dial the phone numbers yourself. And one of those that was quite popular at the time was the A. Hayes 300 baud smart modem that was introduced in 1981. And it really did uh, change a lot of things for uh, people that were getting online. It had an ability to plug in directly to the phone system and could dial numbers directly, as well as answers calls automatically. Despite its price, these features made the smart modem attractive to uh, bulletin board um, operators known as sysops. So unfortunately for Hayes, a lot of other manufacturers liked the smart motors features and duplicated them on devices that sold for a fraction of the cost. Soon a number of Hayes compatible modems popped up eroding Hayes' original market. Hayes managed to hang on until the 90s before they child, uh, filed uh, chapter 11. But that name is still in use today. And as time passed, the speed of modems continued to get faster and faster. The first modems as analog devices were 300 bits per second. Then we had the 1200 uh, bit models, the 9600 the 14.4K, the 28.8K, and the 56K. And I recall, I would, as soon as a faster one would come out, I would go out and buy it so I could get the fastest speed possible. And I think I did end up having a 56K at one point. But uh, in addition to the faster speeds, we also had advances in echo cancellation and noise reduction technology have to make all this possible. At the start of the 90s, the internet was making its way from the universities and research labs into public consciousness, which also provided demand for more, better, faster modems. Instead of an add-on, they became standard equipment on all new PCs, but the fastest dial-up modems were still not fast enough. With the explosion of the World Wide Web, users wanted to surf even faster they turned to services like cable and DSL, which provided faster broadband access. However, DSL and cable modems weren't strictly modems in the traditional sense as they had a completely digital signal path. 
The popularity of mobile computing led to the growth of wireless technology, including Wi-Fi. Of the modern devices, Wi-Fi might be the closest to the traditional modem because it encodes data into radio waves and turn radio waves back into data. Most people in North America today use broadband, while only 3% of us still use dial-up. The way we access the internet has also changed as more people log on to smartphones and other mobile devices, often bypassing the traditional PC. Even with all these changes we've seen, it's always important to remember that we just didn't wake up one day and have internet. Looking back to see where we've been is a way to appreciate how far we've come and perhaps how far we still have to go. For many people in the 80s and the early 90s, the primary reason to get a modem was to access bulletin board systems or what was called BBSs. While it's fashionable these days to describe past online media as a precursor to social networking services like Facebook, there are definite similarities in that they offer users a form for posting and replying to public messages a kind of email and often games. But in, con in contrast to modern social network services, BBSs were almost exclusively local. Many computer clubs had a BBS, and I think our club had one as well, that's before I joined the club, but they were quite popular at the time. And I remember uh, spending lots of time on those uh, boards. But this all came about with two guys, one named Ward Christensen and Randy Seuss. They created the first public bulletin board, uh, taking advantage of a blizzard in their hometown of Chicago to build it. The idea quickly spread across the country and around the world. And for an entertaining look at BBS culture through the eyes of people who lived through its heyday, you should check out Jason Scott's excellent BBS, the documentary, it's creative common license. So you can watch it guilt-free on YouTube and you could get the videos from here. We'll have that information uh, passed to you also. <clears throat> but today, uh, no one uses DOM ter terminals or terminal emulators to connect to an individual computer. The internet lets us connect to any machine in the world via internet an internet service provider with your modem routing TCP slash IP packets between you and your ISP via, via what's called point to point protocol, RPPP. TCP slash IP dictates how information should be packaged, turning bundles of information called packets that are sent and received and how to get to its destination. The same process occurs to get data from your ISP to your computer. So the, the type of modems that we're using today, one is the one that I remember having uh, at the very start was what was called a DSL modem. And when you connect to the internet, you might connect through a regular modem through your local area network or LAN uh, connection in your office or home through a cable modem or through a digital subscriber line, which is referred to as DSL. DSL is a high-speed connection that uses the same wires as your regular telephone line. You can leave your internet connection open and still use your phone line for voice calls. The other type of modem is a cable modem, and that's the one that's probably the most popular today. A cable modem uses your TV cable to get high-speed connections to the internet. It operates over coax cable TV lines and provide high-speed internet access. And since cable modems offer always-on connection and fast data transfer, they are considered broadband devices. Here's a typical commercial uh, cable modem that uh, you can purchase from 
Best Buy or any of the big box stores or even um, Amazon, wherever. And if you notice on the, this is a label that's attached to the bottom of the device. And it shows you that it's a DOCSIS 3.1 cable modem. And it also shows you that it's compatible with these providers, Cox, Spectrum, and Xfinity. So you would be okay with purchasing this modem if you wanted to purchase your own. And once you've gotten that, you would plug it into your computer. Make sure your computer is near a wall socket. And then you plug the cable modem into the wall cable socket. And then you plug in the cable modem's power cord. And remember that most, uh, I, mean, I guess it's worth noting, most modems do not have an on and off switch. So plugging and unplugging them is how you turn them on or off. When the uh, cable moment is turned on, it goes through what is referred to as a boot process. And you can tell this process is done when most of the lights have turned on and stopped blinking. But there's gonna be usually one that will continue to blink and that's referred to as an activity light. For this all to occur, it takes about 30 to 60 seconds for the modem to uh, boot up. And if you've purchased a new modem, you will need to call your cable ISP and give them the information about it. Otherwise, they will not be able to recognize it being associated with your account. You'll need to have your modem serial number and its MAC address, both which we, we printed on the label that's at the bottom of the, are on the side. And then you want to test your connection. And you can do that by opening a web browser and go to a website you haven't been to before. And if you do go to a website you've been recently, your browser might uh, load it from the cache. So you really don't know if you're actually connected to the internet. So if that uh, loads, then uh, if the website loads and you're connected, but if not, then you need to follow these steps by testing your uh, connection by going to uh, uh, another program. You know, like something like a search engine is a good way to do this. You can use any program that has an internet connection that would uh, indicate that you're online. The other type of modem is a, um, what we talked about earlier was the DSL modems. And uh, so we're gonna go run through how those are connected. As you can see, uh, this DSL modem, uh, the only uh, compatibility it's for is a company called Century Link. So if you have a DSL modem, you want to just uh, make sure again that you're close to a wall cable socket as well as an AC outlet too. I didn't mention that before. So you're gonna plug the uh, power cord into uh, the wall. And again, just like the other modems, just plugging them and unplugging them is the way you turn them on or off. Uh, when the uh, DSL modem goes through a boot process, you can tell again that um, it's done when most of the lights have turned on and stopped blinking. And again, there's gonna be one that will be continue blinking. And as I said earlier, that's what's referred to as an activity light. And in this case, as the other previous modem, it takes about 30 to 60 seconds. Um, and uh, here again, you still will need to call uh, your DSL uh, uh, ISP to associate your modem with your uh, user account and password. Uh, and if you don't know what these are, you need to call your um, ISP to get them. 
uh, you'll want to log on to the modem's administrative screen, uh, open up in your web browser, and the address field, you want to type the modem's IP address. It's often printed on the modem itself. If not, it'll be in the manual. Usually it's 192.168.0.1. Those are the most common ones. And then you want to enter your DSL uh, username and password. And once you're connected uh, to the modem's uh, administrator screen, you want to look for something that says PPPOE. And then you enter your username and password in those fields. And your username is usually your email address. If you don't know your account, username and password, again, contact your DSL ISP. Uh, when the uh, setup is complete, you're saved the settings, internet light on your modem should turn green, which will indicate that you're online. And of course, you want to test your internet connection like you did before, open a web browser, and then go to a website you haven't been before. And if the website uh, you have been um, keep in mind, if you've been to that website, it might be loading from its from cache or memory. Uh, so if it loads, then you're connected to the internet. If not, you want to uh, uh, call these steps by searching for something using a search engine um, to uh, see if you're uh, connected. So more about modems and uh, a term that you will see are here is called uh, DOCSIS. In actuality, all modems are generally very simple devices and they work the same. The biggest difference between them is the standard they support, which determines the internet speed capacity they are capable of delivering. The standard is called Data Over Cable Service Interface, specification R, DOCSIS, D-O-C-S-I-S. And currently, all, uh, they all use, the ISPs are all using DOCSIS version either 3.0 or 3.1. And so the Data Cable Service Interface specification is an international telecommunication standard that permits the addition, addition of high bandwidth data transfer to an existing cable uh, TV system. It is used by many cable television operators to provide internet access over their existing hybrid fiber coaxial infrastructure. The version numbers are sometimes prefixed with simply a D instead of the D-O-C-S-I-S. -S. So D3 would be for DOCSIS 3. The specification is an international standard that allows um, for data transfer to an existing coaxial cable TV system. And it's important for us internet users and internet providers because it allows internet speeds to increase without having to completely replace coaxial cable networks. In an ideal world, everyone would have fiber optics in their homes, but it would cost billions of dollars to make that happen. DOCSIS matters for us as consumers because almost all internet service providers have moved to this standard and you have to decide which DOCSIS standard you need when you're purchasing a modem for your cable internet connection. Should you purchase your own modem, packaging will be clearly marked, as I showed you earlier, as to what ISP the device is compatible. Um, here's a tip. If your modem has not been changed out within the past five or so years, you should check your ISP about a replacement. When we talk about routers, computer routers have existed. Well, first, uh, let's uh, see if there's any questions at this point. Judy? You might need to give her a minute for taking care of the transcriptions. 
go ahead and go on though. Yeah, go ahead and go on, Bill. Okay. Um, so now we're going to get into routers. Um, computer routers have existed since the early days of the internet, even though many people think it's newer technology. Without a router, the internet couldn't exist. Traditional routers are devices that connect different computer networks together. A router is also capable of connecting a computer to multiple networks, and that's referred to as bridging. Wireless routers are hardware devices that internet service providers use to connect you to their cable or DSL internet network. They are sometimes referred to as wireless local area network devices and can function as a wireless access point and a traditional router. There are gaming routers that are Wi-Fi devices that give priority to multiplayer online games when given a list of gaming sites or URLs. That's a different type of router. Routers that provide a higher quality of service transmission to and from uh, uh, those URLs. MISH routers are a whole home Wi-Fi system consisting of a main router that connects directly to your modem and a series of satellite modules or nodes placed around your house for full Wi-Fi coverage. They are part of a single wireless network and share the same SSID and password, unlike traditional Wi-Fi motors, routers. We'll get into that a little deeper in a, in a few minutes. But route, mesh routers are becoming very popular. Um, so almost every house now has a broadband connection. Uh, and uh, Wi-Fi routers are becoming more popular than ever. Most uh, devices on the market, such as smartphones, computer lights, doorbells, locks, and some home appliances are equipped to use Wi-Fi. Though Wi-Fi has become an integral part of our routine, most of us do not know much about the technology. The history of evolution of Wi-Fi routers is fascinating, and an earlier form of Wi-Fi was in existence, has been in existence since 1971. Apparently, Aloha Net accounted for connecting the Hawaiian Islands with the aid from a wireless network asset. Alaho Net and Alahu uh, Protocol are all early forerunners of the concept of Ethernet, which later transcends to the IEEE 802.11 internet protocols. When you buy a wireless router, you'll notice the term AC following by a number somewhere in the name. Newer models may include the letters AX followed by a larger number. The AC, AC suffix indicates that the router supports the 802.11 AC or Wi-Fi 5 wireless network standard, which provides fast Wi-Fi network connection at 5G, at 5 gigahertz, excuse me. The suffix AX indicates that the router supports the 802.11 AX or Wi-Fi 6 wireless network standard. The number following the AC or AX represents the router's maximum theoretical bandwidth, 1200 megabits per second equals uh, 1200 uh, megabits per second. 1900 uh, megabits uh, represents, equals 1900 megabits per second, and 32 megabits per second equals 32 megabits, and so on. When you see the AC2300 in a router name, it means you're dealing with a Wi-Fi router that offers a wireless network based on the 802.11ac or Wi-Fi 5 standard, which a total of 
theoretical bandwidth of 2300 megabits per second. You might be tempted to believe that uh, an AC3200 router provides 32 megabits per second, but that would be incredible, but unfortunately it's not true. The, the truth is that this naming convention is ineffective when making a purchasing decision. It's more of a marketing ploy to trick you in thinking that a router is faster than it actually is. And then we have the question about the number of antennas. Most current Wi-Fi routers, such as Netgear, Nighthawk, and TP-Link AC1750 smart Wi-Fi routers include three to six antennae, compared to older routers that only had one or two. Wi-Fi routers use several antennas to help increase data transfer speed and reliability. A router with multiple antennas must uh, may broadcast multiple streams of data at the same time multiple input, multiple output, or otherwise known as MIMO, resulting in increased speed. Additionally, they make it easier to use the beam forming technique, which has focus signals on a target device. It's crucial to remember also that in order to fully benefit from MIMO routers, higher transfer rates, you're receiving devices your receiving devices must likewise handle multiple streams of data via multiple antennas. A Wi-Fi router can have six to eight antennas, but only support three data streams. The remaining antennas are usually utilized for beams forming and antenna diversity. External antenna wireless routers are not inherently superior than those that have inside antennae but they do provide better directional control. That means that if the external antenna is properly positioned, they can send a strong signal in the direction of the target. Routers with built-in antenna, on the other hand, are better with uniformly spreading the signals. So here's a typical router. Uh, as you notice, um, this is the box that the router comes in, and you'll notice that it, uh, the wireless standard is um, on the box. It says AC speed. So you want to look for a router that supports the newest standard, which would be 802.11. Uh, well, this is AC, but it, it's 8X now for maximum speed and coverage. Um, antennas, when it comes to antennas, and some opinion quality uh, is better than quantity. You wanna look for the latest security, uh, which uh, WA, WPA2 and three is the most secure networking protocol with three being the latest, but it's also not necessarily compatible with all devices. So for a while until uh, everybody gets on board we're going to be stuck with using uh, WPA2. So some routers now have a compatibility mode where they'll have both the WAP, the WPA2 and 3 standard, and the router is capable of selecting the correct, uh, I mean, the, the devices, the router is capable of providing both of those security protocols and the, the, the receiving device can be able to use which one's appropriate. And of course, speed, advertised speeds are usually theoretical maximums. Actual speed depends on a variety of factors in your home. And then frequency channels. Dual band routers support more devices and activities. Uh, and you're gonna see, um, uh, tri-band routers also coming out where you'll find, like in the past, a tri-band tri -band router had uh, a 2.4 gigahertz uh, band and then it had two 5 gigahertz bands. Well, the new ones now have a 2, a 5, and a 6. And we can uh, discuss that some too. 
So when you're setting up our router, you want to consider uh, the best place. Uh, finding an open space toward the center of your resident is the optimal, gives optimal coverage. But I find uh, very few people are have a situation where they can actually place a router in the middle of their house. So uh, usually it's gonna be in some other uh, location, but you wanna be aware of walls and floors that impede your uh, Wi-Fi signal. So more obstructions you have between your devices and your router, the weaker and potentially slower the signal will be. You wanna try to avoid being in proximity of large metal, glass, brick, or concrete objects. Uh, Wi-Fi mesh systems get around this problem by letting you place an attractive design node wherever coverage is the weakest. But for those working with standard routers or even wireless range extenders, this will require some patience and testing to see where your optimal placement areas are. I have a mesh router that I'm using and I have one node, which is actually placed in a laundry room because I have two appliances, a washer and dryer that are internet connected. The laundry area is the furthest uh, area in my house. So I played around with moving that node into various places till I got really the best possible signal. And so uh, it resides in the laundry room and um, it provides um, uh, internet, I mean, Wi-Fi access to those appliances plus some other things that are also located in my kitchen. So you can just play around these, the router, once you get them, the nodes, once you get them set up, you can just unplug them and place them any place and uh, they'll reconnect to the uh, main router. So um, when you're starting the process of correcting your uh, router to your modem, you wanna, uh, uh, have a couple of things. You'll need an internet cable, which you'll want to plug into the wide area network port on your router's face. And normally it um, looks like the picture we have here where uh, it'll say internet or it'll say a wand, but it'll be located, usually it's a yellow uh, uh, outline around the port. And the cable that you're provided is also at times yellow. But before we go any further, let's discuss the difference between WAN and LAN. What's the difference? Quick exercise. Connect your phone to Wi-Fi and then browse over to your favorite website. How did everything go? Well, congratulations. You just used a LAN and a WAN network, WAN network, and perhaps didn't even realize it. How did that happen? You connected first to a LAN and were then forwarded to and from a WAN, which in this example was the internet. So LAN and WAN defined. Your local area network, LAN, is an acronym for local area network. The term wide area network refers to a network that spans a large area. Let's start with something that almost everyone has heard of, the internet. The internet is the world's largest WAN. It, it's a great example of wide area networking because it allows you to leave your local area network and view websites that aren't on your local network. They, not, they may not even be in your country, which is why the internet is such a wonderful thing. Most routers come with some administrative website you can access by typing in the IP address into your favorite web browser and entering your logon and password, which you change from admin admin or admin password, we hope. And if you're lucky, you have a smart a router that is a bit easier to configure via an app, but most people, and their older non-mesh Wi-Fi gear will probably be stuck with using a website. My new uh, 
router, I use my smartphone to configure it. So unless your manufacturer has a built-in easy mode into the experience, a router's admin page can feel overwhelming at first glance, especially if you're not um, use much of the terminology you find. Our goal today is to help you get your router's most important features set up and explain all the other details you ought to know about. The first step to get your network up and running will be to set up a username and password. If you happen to have a pre-owned router, the username and password can be reset to factory defaults by holding a recess button somewhere on the router, usually on the back. It could be on the side. Often these defaults are something like admin and password, which every would-be hacker knows, so make sure to change these right away. Be sure to use a secure password that includes a mix of uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers, and symbols. Once you're there, the first thing you want to do is select what's referred to as an SSID. If you're upgrading a wireless router and want to save yourself some time, I recommend you use the same SSID. Choose whatever name you want. It's your wireless network. You either will be asked to use one SSID that will cover all your wireless networks, and your router will decide which device is connected to 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz, or you'll be able to set separate names for each wireless network you run on each band. The latter is better because it's good to know what you're connecting to, but plenty of people go for the former for the extra convenience. Well, it seems trivial, there are actually a few things you need to know about naming your router. Uh, to start, the name of your router and wireless network are different. Naming your wireless network is really naming the service set identifier or the SSID that the router broadcasts. That's the name that you'll see when you show a list of networks. Uh, what you select on your computer when you want to connect your Wi-Fi network to get online. If you're upgrading a wireless router and want to save yourself some time, I recommend you use the same SSID. One thing is that when you um, set it up the first, if you already have an existing, um, had an existing Wi-Fi network and you changed out the router, if you use the same user ID and password when you set up the new router, all your devices should reconnect without having any interruption. If you unfortunately make the mistake of mistyping a letter in your SSI in your password, then uh, you're going to be stuck with having to go and reset every Wi Fi device you have in your home. Take it from me, I've done that. So, SSIDs are really super important. The router name is not. So, you want to give each network a solid password. That's, that's all you need to get the Wi Fi working. However, it is possible your router might have a few more options to pick from uh, in the advanced mode. And here's a, a typical um, routing um, page on a website, and it shows you uh, lots of information on the settings. Uh, and you can uh, see at the bottom here, other options, register to receive special offers and updates, router details, and then advanced settings. When you go to the advanced settings, you'll find uh, some other things that you can do. And that's when we uh, go to what is referring to configuring your router. So with your username and password sets, you can proceed to configure your routing settings. As with cooking a dinner, there's no right way to install a router and every model is likely to have its own unique steps depending on its features and the manufacturer. Because of this, trying to describe every possible configuration path here would be exhausting and pointless. 
So we recommend you consult your router's manual for specifics. Uh, visit a few YouTube videos on the subject for further recommendations and advice. And that said, we do have a few points of advice. You want to use the easy setup wizard. Most routers provide some brief setup routine that asks for a little more than the SSID and password. And if in doubt, start with this. The SSID is your router's Wi-Fi name. It might be something like ASUS or Netgear out of the box, but feel free to change it to something as creative like FBI surveillance van. Uh, this utility will get you as far as the set of blinking green lights, but even for those looking to go beyond that stage, you need to get there first. So you're following the router's uh, documentation using its own setup utility. That's the shortest path to get everything running. So when in doubt, let the router do it. The auto configuration twos are your friend. For example, you can certainly go to the trouble of building your own internal IP address range and assigning static addresses to all your devices by hand. But by simply checking the dynamic host configuration protocol box in your router settings, it will take care of all of that immediately. And it, uh, since it will automatically assign a uh, protocol, uh, since this protocol will automatically assign all the IP addresses to those devices. The lesson here is just because you've changed something doesn't mean you should, or at least doing setup in early stages, go with the oddest settings uh, as much as possible. On the client device side, all other things being equal, five gigahertz connections will provide better performance at short ranges than 2.4 gigahertz. And that's because the five gigahertz, while somewhat faster, can travel as far or transmit through some objects due to the band's shorter wavelengths. The 2.4 gigahertz band tends to have more congestion and fewer channel options. That said, if you want to keep using 2.4 gigahertz, consider experimenting with channel selection. Auto usually does a decent job of hopping around the channel options and finding the best ones. But if you're struggling with client connections, try manually setting the channel to one or 11. The, the 2.4 gigahertz band has a total of 11 channels that you can switch between to avoid interference, with channel six usually being the default. When you select a given channel, there's usually some signal spillover. So selecting channel two, for example, will often spill traffic onto channel one or three, thus switching the extremes of 11, of, from one to 11, the furthest points from the default of six can sometimes ensure the best performing connections. <clears throat> the newer six gigahertz band in the newer routers will eliminate the congestion. The new devices that are capable of connecting to the six gigahertz band was will enjoy a wider, uh, will enjoy a wider bandwidth. The number to make the numbers make a difference. The, 2.4 gigahertz travels further, but six gigahertz delivers data faster. What really matters isn't the specific frequencies being used, but how a large swath of airways is available. That's why the six gigahertz is particularly exciting. The new bandwidth quadruples the total space available to traditional Wi-Fi. Another thing you can use is when you're setting up your Wi-Fi devices is using the uh, uh, WPS. If you ever paired um, two Bluetooth devices, such as a smartphone with headphones, then you already have the basic understanding how WPS works. Let's say you want to connect a Windows 10 laptop to your router. On your laptop, you'll see your router's SSID pop up on the list of visible wireless networks and windows. When you select the SSID and attempt to connect, 
Windows will prompt you to enter the network security key, which is a needless technical way of saying password. If you've done the, your pro job properly, your security and created a, uh, with your security, you created a password with randomized uppercase, lowercase letters, numbers, symbols, that you might have forgotten it and don't want to mess around with typing it again. Instead, you just press the WPS button on your router and then on your device. You should allow at least a minute for the router and laptop to find each other and successfully pair. Keep in mind that WPS only works with Windows and Android devices. It does not work with Apple. So after an easy setup, some routers will walk you through a few extra steps, such as establishing parental controls, features that allow you to filter certain types of content, and automatically updating the router's firmware. Taking it to the next level with most routers is more than simply activating your network and connecting to the internet. That's only scratching the surface of what you can do. While the tab name like advanced settings may seem a bit intimidating, the menu contained here often allows you to control some of your router's most helpful features. And we'll cover some of the most compelling items. Quality of service is one of the most useful features for online entertainment. It allows you to select and prioritize the upstream and downstream traffic on your network, which you can provide a performance boost for your favorite streaming services or online games. Most routers will have a tab in their app configuration page dedicated to traffic monitoring. Navigate to this and find the QoS tab. Turn on QoS and then you can prioritize certain services such as online games or video streaming. You can also prioritize devices on the network. In this example, oh, years ago, there was usually done by supplying the device's unique MAC address and setting a priority level, priority level for that device. These days, vendors are increasingly supplying a more intuitive graphical approach to the same idea as in the manual, uh, as in this manual um, polarization screenshot. In this example, your devices are displayed and uh, by default, they all fall in a normal priority queue. And you see we have a Roku stick, or Apple TV. Um, there's another Roku, Asus, um, no, Alexa, and then an iPhone and uh, some other home devices. So, um, so you're using this instance, the up and down arrows to uh, set a higher priority or lower priority to that particular device. And then you click the save button. So that means that uh, the prioritization for uh, the network uh, signals will go to the devices that have the higher priority. Another um, feature of routers is your guest network. And it's handy to have if you prefer to keep all your data and files on your personal network out of unapproved hands. And to set one up, you just go to your router's app configuration page and navigate to wireless settings. Most routers have guest networks disabled by default so there will be use a page to set one up and you just confirm the network's name and password and the network will be set up. You can give it any name you want or and password. I tend to leave mine pretty simple because um, if someone asks they want to get on the, um, get on the internet, I want to be able to just tell them what's well, this name and here's the password. Uh, usually it's a, just a, a phrase that I can remember and so I can easily tell it, tell them what it is without having to go uh, looking for it. So um, 
It's also recommended to apply LACE WPA encryption to, to your regular Wi-Fi network, but you may not want you may want to leave the uh, guest network open for easier access. Um, that's uh, you have that choice when you're uh, setting up the network what encryption you want to set, and you can do either uh, none or leave it open or set it but it's a completely separate network from your other um, network that you have for your own personal use so while it's convenient um, this might encourage uh, connections from neighbors and straight people <laughs> uh, uh, parking on your curb so you want to uh, limit your um, uh, network uh, access privileges and uh, um, in other words what band they can use at what hours or the network is active and you also can limit the, either if, if they're going to be on the 2.4 gigahertz or the 5 gigahertz uh, and not both one of the other features of using a router is being able to use the file transfer protocol if you uh, remember the old days before Dropbox, you could transfer large files between system uh, through several, uh, 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 which really required a lot of work to do that. But uh, FTP may have fallen out of common use, but technology can still be handy in ways to transfer lots of files without dealing with cloud services. So FTP servers are only available to routers that have at least one USB port. And the first thing you need is the, a USB storage device, such as an external hard drive plugged into your router. Sometimes it's known as uh, network attached storage. Uh, next, make your way to the advanced settings on the app configuration page and find a tab that says USB storage uh, USB settings or something similar. Uh, once in that tab, click the check box for FTP via internet or something similar. And your USB device now will be available to users on your network. If you would like to be the only one to access a USB device, you can modify the read and write access to be admin only. And some writers have you configure read and write access for specific folders. So you simply want to connect new folder or select folder or something similar and navigate to the desired folder on your USB device. Uh, just select the folder that you want to apply these uh, changes and select OK. Here's a page of an example of this of, of a FTP server on an ASUS router, and you can see it shows uh, the different options that you can use uh, to uh, for your uh, FTP server. Another uh, option is uh, MAC access uh, address filtering, and you. Um, Think of MAC uh, or Media Access Control Address as a universally unique name for any network device. The address is tied to the device hardware. Some routers allow you to set a list of specific MAC addresses that can or can't access your network. It's like blacklisting or whitelisting what devices can access your LAN. Netgear devices setting, Netgear device setting configuration. To do this, find the MAC filter under the Advanced Settings tab. Uh, dual and tri bars or typical health, you select which band the filter will apply to, and some routers will have you select whether the entered MAC address will be the only one accepted onto the network or the only address to reject it. Once you set your preferences for these options, the last step is to find the MAC addresses on the devices you'd like to filter and type them in. 
Another option is parental controls. Parental controls at a minimum lets you establish time limits for each allowed device identified by a MAC address that we discussed previously uh, that can be on the network. So if your grandkids have a bad habit of using devices long after bedtime, and you don't want to constantly play the bad cop who has to police where and when devices get turned off every night, no problem. Use a MAC address filtering to make sure that only approved devices can connect to your router. Then use the parental controls to make sure those allowed devices can only connect within those approved hours. It only takes a few minutes to set that up and it's like having a well-configured router will cure innumerable headaches and make sure your household runs much more smoothly. So now we're going to talk about more about Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is a wireless network technology that allows devices such as computers, laptops, and desktops, mobile devices, your smartphone, your wearables, and other uh, equipment, printers, video cameras uh, to interface with the internet. It allows these devices and many more of the IoT devices to exchange information with one another, creating a network. IoT means Internet of Things. When you access Wi-Fi, you're connecting to a wireless router that allows your Wi-Fi compatible devices to interface with the internet. The Wi-Fi Alliance um, came about in 1999 when several visionary companies came together to form a global nonprofit association with the goal of driving the best user experience, regardless of brand, and using a new wireless network technology. In 2000, the group adopted the term Wi-Fi as the proper name for its technical work and announced its official name, Wi-Fi Alliance. Wi-Fi is not an acronym. The term was called uh, by a branding company and it's only caught on in its abbreviated form. On the technical side, how does Wi-Fi work? Well, the 802.11 is a set of IEEE standards that govern wireless network transmissions and methods. Each standard is amended that was ratified, uh, is an amendment that was ratified over time the, standard op the standards operate on various frequencies delivering different bandwidths and support different numbers of channels. The 802.11a and b were developed about the same time in 1999. Um, b uh, enjoyed faster acceptance because it implemented was more affordable. They used different frequencies, so they're really incompatible. The uh, 802.11a found a niche with businesses, while the less expensive 802.11b became a standard in homes. Then there was 11g emerged as a hybrid standard that contained the top rated features of both A and B. And despite the bandwidth and good speed, it faced interference from other appliances. So then came uh, 802.11n, and it's used around the world, and it evolved in terms of wireless antennas and signals. And it has capability of transferring data at speeds of a maximum 450 uh, megabits per second. It even um, has a better bandwidth uh, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz and limited interference. Uh, then came along the dot 11 AD with a higher frequency, better speed, but shorter range. And is capable of providing speeds 
uh, within the range of saving gigabytes per second as well as higher internet speeds. <coughs> And the newest one that's showing up is uh, 802.11ax. And uh, it has high connectivity through uh, multiple uh, use, uh, multiple input and multiple output technology. And it's a variant that focuses mainly on, the, uh, on a lot of uh, advanced features as well as enhanced life sustainability. Um, it also highlights the advancements such as Bluetooth 5.0 technology and infrared connectivity. The dominant feature that is lacking is the improved speed. Um, new names. The Wi-Fi Alliance introduced Wi-Fi 6 as the industry designation for products and networks that support the next generation of Wi-Fi based on the 802.11 AX technology. Wi-Fi 6 is part of a new naming approach by Wi-Fi Alliance that provided users with an easy to understand designation for both Wi-Fi technology supported by their device and used in a connection, in connection with the device that makes uh, with a Wi-Fi network. The new naming system identifies Wi-Fi generations by numerical sequence, which corresponds to major advancements in Wi-Fi. The generation names can be used by product vendors to identify the latest Wi-Fi technology uh, that the device supports. By operating system vendors to identify the generation of Wi-Fi connection between a device and the network, and by the service providers to identify the capabilities of a Wi-Fi network to their customers. So the new numerical sequences are Wi-Fi 4 is the new name for 802.11n. Wi-Fi 5 is the new destination for 802.11ac and then Wi-Fi 6 is the designation for 802.11ax. And then there's also one other one that's Wi-Fi 6e, which is the designation for 802.11ax extended technology. So, Wi-Fi 6, that's something that's probably you're hearing a lot about. Simply put, it means, um, uh, well, Wi-Fi 6E particularly means that it's Wi-Fi 6 extended to the uh, 6 gigahertz band. And Wi-Fi 6E works with the same standard as Wi-Fi 6, but with an extended spectrum. <clears throat> the 6 gigahertz uh, band is a new frequency band ranging from 5.925 gigahertz to 7.125 gigahertz, allowing up to 1200 megahertz of additional spectrum. Unlike the existing bands on which channels are currently crammed into limited spectrum, the 6 gigahertz band exists without overlapping or interference. Access to the six gigahertz frequency brings more bandwidth, faster speeds, and lower latency, opening up resources for future innovations like augmented reality and virtual reality, 8K streaming, and more. Some other Wi-Fi features is um, wireless access uh, wireless access points. A wireless access point allows a wireless device to connect to the wireless network. What a wireless access point does for your network is like what an amplifier does to your home stereo. A wireless access point takes the bandwidth coming from a router and stretches it in to so many devices 
can go on a network from further distances. So that many devices can go on networks from further distances. A wireless access point does more than simply extend Wi-Fi. It also gives you useful data about devices on, on the network, rise proactive tip, security and serves many other practical purposes. <clears throat> so a hotspot should not get be confused with a um, mobile hotspot. A mobile hotspot is a common feature of smartphones for both tethered and un, a tethered and untethered connections. So when you turn on your phone's mobile hotspot, you share your wireless network connection with other devices so that they can access the internet. There's a lot of benefits that you can uh, be uh, gathered from using Wi-Fi. First is the convenience. Wireless network allows multiple users to connect through the same network. In a fraction of a second, without any configuration, connections can be made through the router or hotspot technology. This case of use and convenience is not present in wired networks. In a wired network, it takes more time to configure and allow access for multiple users. You also have mobility. As long as you are in the range of a Wi-Fi access point with a Wi-Fi, with Wi-Fi, you can access the internet from anywhere you want, especially with mobile devices. You don't have to always sit right in front of the computer to get internet access. You can pay your bills, um, send email, search the internet, like I do from the patio, which is uh, yards from my router. And it also allows you to use a laptop or, or any kind of mobile or tablet, whatever, anywhere you want. So you can be sitting uh, comfortably uh, in some other part of the house and never not tether to a desktop. Also productivity, users who connect to Wi-Fi network can experience different ranges of speed as they move from one location to another. There is also less chance of experiencing technical glitches with wireless LAN, as well as users can be more engaged, uh, complete tasks, and enhance their overall productivity. Deployment. The installation of Wi-Fi access points are rather easy compared to wired network connections. There's no complex cables running in different locations or operating switches. Think of uh, setting up a desktop with network connection in your home office. Installing a new Wi-Fi router is easy rather than fitting a complex cable network. And it's also expandable. You can add new users to a Wi-Fi network uh, with the proper wireless LAN or credentials, more users can access uh, the Wi-Fi. In addition, there's no need to install any type of equipment all can be done with existing uh, devices. Uh, the significant saves your time and effort. Cost. Compared to a wired network connection, wireless networks offer significant advantages in terms of cost and labor, especially when installing a new Wi-Fi network. You can cut down the expenses in wiring and maintenance. Out of these, the bigger expense comes from the wiring part. Since very small numbers of wires are used here, you save money. And there are some disadvantages. One is uh, security. Even though many encryption techniques are taken by wireless networks, still Wi-Fi is vulnerable to hacking. Due to its wireless nature, it has a high chance of being hacked, especially public Wi-Fi networks. Since public Wi-Fi networks are open for anyone, hackers can impose their fake networking ID. Without consent, users may connect to this fake ID and fall into the category of cyber attack victims. 
range is also uh, an issue. Uh, it's limited typically between 100 and 150 feet. While it's sufficient for a normal home, it actually can be a problem for building structures. The strength of Wi-Fi, the strength of our Wi-Fi network will be re reducing as you move away from the access point. Since buildings can be multi-story, the strength of the Wi-Fi network can vary at different floors. The cloud weakens overflow. The only way to overcome this is by purchasing additional access points. Speed. The speed of a Wi-Fi connection is far slower than a wire connection, around 1 to 54 megabits per second. This may look fine if there are a few devices connected to the network, but the moment the more devices connected, you could uh, experience a drastic reduction in speed. A Wi-Fi network works on the frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. This frequency has high chances of getting hindered due to the electromagnet waves and other forms of obstacles. As a result, you may frequently experience connectivity issues and weak signal strength, especially during large file transfers. The signal can get interfered. <clears throat> As for bandwidth, many routers only allow 30 maximum devices to be connected. The bandwidth of Wi-Fi network get weaker as you add more devices is solely reserved for a single user. Most often when the bandwidth gets limited, users can experience slower speeds. And there's also been some concerns about health. There are certain conspiracy theories about Wi-Fi that causes health issues in humans. Some of them are cancer, insomnia, apoptosis, same as the effects caused by microfrequencies, EMF. It's also a phony notion about the effects caused from the microwave frequencies and advising pregnant women not to get exposed to wave Wi-Fi signals as it releases electromagnetic radiation. And the other one is power outages, temporary loss of connectivity. Once power is restored, most devices will reconnect. And the newest device on a router that's uh, on the market is MISH Wi-Fi routers. And we'll talk about those briefly. A MISH Wi-Fi, our whole home Wi-Fi system consists of a main router that connects directly to your modem and a series of satellite modems or nodes placed around your house for full Wi-Fi coverage. They're all part of a single wireless network and share the same SSID and password, unlike traditional Wi-Fi routers. And what I mean by this is that if you have a traditional router and you place an extender, you'll notice that the SSID for that extender will have a underscore X EXT added to the uh, network name. So technically that is not the same network. And so as you, even though it will connect to your device, but it will do so um, in a way that it won't be, um, you will have a dropout until it reconnects. It's not a seamless connection as it is with uh, using a MISH router. So picture this, you just set up your home network with the latest Wi-Fi hardware and 100 uh, megabits per second internet connection. But so for some reason, you're still encountering buffering when you try to stream video in the bedroom. You call your ISP and everything checks out, so what's the deal? Chances are your Wi-Fi isn't set up efficiently for a mesh Wi-Fi wi wi system. The weakness seeking our Wi-Fi death spots could be the result of physical obstructions. So simple things like floors, doors, and walls in your home can come between you and your router, especially if they're made of metal, brick, or concrete. Or perhaps the distance is simply too great 
in a large room and your traditional router is only capable of reaching as far as the kitchen, but not to the backyard, garage, or distant bedroom. Interference from other devices also could be the culprit, whether it's the microwave, cordless phone, or baby monitor. If you live in close quarters with other Wi-Fi networks and devices, such as an apartment complex, this problem increases tenfold. Think of it like a room full of people who are speaking at once. Nobody's going to be heard very well. Better solution is Wi-Fi that works with your home design instead of against it. Think of a standard router like a speaker. You could be playing music loudly in the front of your home, but in the office in the back will only hear a fat echo. A standard router works the same way. You can only move so far from it before the signal starts to wane, and eventually it's going to cut out altogether. Instead, why not install a speaker in each room of the house? And that's how a whole home Wi-Fi or mesh network works with multiple nodes installed around the home so you get a solid Wi-Fi coverage from one end to the other, even in the backyard. Wired and wireless expansion. In a module system, there's one node connected to your modem that acts as a router. Each additional node finds the best channel and path to wirelessly connect to the previous one, creating a seamless and reliable Wi-Fi connection throughout your entire home. However, if your home is already wired with ethernet cables in every room, so some mesh system can still connect the nodes together using an ethernet cable to create a whole home Wi-Fi system. Even using the wired option, you still will be able to expand your signal to hard to reach areas, such as the garage and basement. The name MISH network in itself implies that every component of your Wi-Fi system is working together and seamless roaming is a perfect example of that. When you use a router and a range extender combination, you have to switch between the networks manually as you move from one coverage zone to the other, as I explained earlier. But with the seamless roaming, you have one network with one name and password. That means that you move about your home. You never have to manually switch from one network to the other. So go ahead, stream video in the living room, kitchen, bedroom, without worrying about buffering or dropped out connections. As you see in this example, uh, at the very top one uh, is uh, a mesh uh, system where you're getting 100% coverage in each location because the node is just uh, repeating the same information to the device. Where here, where you have a, the traditional, you have uh, your router and then you have your range extender. The closest one, of course, is going to um, uh, uh, decrease it by 50% because actually a range extender is really just another Wi-Fi device. Like if you uh, like a laptop or anything. So each time you connect an additional uh, range extender, you're going to take some of your bandwidth. So by the time you get to your device, depending how many nodes you have in your in your in your uh, uh, string, uh, you're gonna you could possibly get just twenty five percent effectiveness for the device that you're trying to connect to. So comparing range extenders to home whole home Wi-Fi is like comparing apples to oranges. Range extenders are certainly effective when it comes to increasing the range of your router, but they do so at the expense of the Wi-Fi performance, which gets cut in half. In a large space where Wi-Fi struggles to reach every corner, a range extender can diminish the overall performance of your network, creating a bottlenecking effect.
you might also experience connection issues when you're jumping from router to extender because you need to switch networks manually. For example, even when standing next to a range extender, you can still experience dead zones or slowdowns if you haven't manually changed your device over to the router signal. These two separate networks have a different names and interfaces, which can be a serious hassle. Wi-Fi security using WEP or uh, WPA. The wired uh, equivalent privacy is a security protocol specified in IEEE Wireless Fidelity Standard 802.11b. This standard is designed to provide a wireless local area network with a level of security and privacy comparable to what is usually expected of a wired LAN. WPA2 has been recommended, is the recommended way to secure wireless networks since 2004 because it's more secure than WEP or WPA. WPA3 makes further security improvements. This is the latest one that makes it harder to break into networks by guessing passwords. It also makes it impossible to decrypt data captured in past in the past, i.e. before the key uh, password was cracked. Stronger, it allows stronger encryption in both enterprise and personal nodes, improved authentication for personal nodes, perfect forwarding, sec, uh, perfect forward secrecy for personal mode communications, and but the downside is not compatible with some legacy, legacy devices. As I told you, some of the newer routers will have a setting that's WPA2 slash three, and it uh, manages to uh, figure out which one will send out both uh, security features so that the receiving device can select whichever one is appropriate. Oops. So here's a, um, a chart that um, we can look at as a wireless cheat sheet. So uh, the encryption standard and WEP was uh, the fast facts was the first 802.11 security standard easily hacked due to its 24 bit initialization vector and weak authentication. And how it worked <clears throat> was uh, it uses the RC4 stream cipher and 64 128-bit keys. Static master key must be manually entered into each device. <clears throat> Should you use it? No. And then the Wi-Fi protected access of WPA was an interim standard to address major WEP flaws, backward compatible, with WEP devices, retain the RC4, but add added longer uh, IVS uh, and two 56-bit keys. Each client gets new keys and TKIP. Enterprise mode, stronger authentication via the 802.11X and EAP. And again, should you use it? And the answer is no. <clears throat> so the current ones is WPA2, and it's upgraded hardware, uh, uh, ensured advanced encryption, and didn't affect any performance. It replaced the R it replaced RC4 and TKIP with CCMP and AES algorithms for stronger authentication and encryption. And should you use it? Yes, if uh, WPA3 is not available or it's incompatible. So the current standard is WPA3 and it's replacing uh, the PSK4 away handshake with SAE and a lot of other security things. And should you use it? And that is yes. <clears throat> So um, we talk about uh, 
IPv4 versus IPv6, uh, we need to talk about the differences between the two protocols. Uh, IP is an abbreviation for internet protocol, and it's a protocol that helps computers devices communicate with one another over the network. As the V in the name suggested, there are different versions of internet protocol, which is IP version four and IP version six. Uh, what is the internet protocol? Well, it's a set of rules that help with routing packets of data so the data can move across networks and make it to the right destination. The internet protocol helps route data around networks to accomplish this. Each device is assigned an IP address. Uh, IP uh, v4 is the original version and it was launched back in 1983. However, the 32-bit format allowed only uh, 4.3 billion unique addresses which really wasn't enough to serve the modern world. So to address that, uh, uh, IP uh, version six was created. It uses 128-bit address format that offers uh, 1,028 times as many unique addresses as IP, IPv4. So for most people, that's all you need to know. IPv6 uses a different format and offers far more unique addresses than IPv4. So getting the most out of your router, anybody can get an internet connection up and running in a few minutes by using your router's quick start guide the most monitors hide lesser known treasures in their setup menus. So if you wanna get the most value possible out of your router investment, take the extra time to uh, explore these advanced options. If you're still in the market for a new router, consider going beyond the box features list and products uh, spec sheets. Download the manual, dig into the advanced options and see which features will deliver the most value in your environment. Once you're up and running, test your internet speed. If you need more guidance, Google uh, the, the 10 tips speed, 10 tips to speed up your Wi-Fi and 12 tips to troubleshoot your internet connection. Again, YouTube videos will give you a wealth of information and recommendations. If you need to find out your router's IP address in Windows 10, as the router has its own unique IP address, you need to know it in order to log into the router. In general, people want to log into their router to update the software, change security settings, set up parental controls, and set up IP address filtering. Router manufacturers like D-Link, Linksys use 192.168.0.1 0.1 and 192.168.1.1 as the default router IP address and makes this information available on their website. The default router IP address should also be available in the instruction manual that came with your router. You should also find the default router IP address printed on the sticker or label attached to the bottom of the uh, device. If the default router IP address has been changed by your ISP, you have to find it on your computer using uh, uh, this method. If you're using Windows laptop or a desktop computer, you can follow the steps below to find your router IP address in Windows 10. So you need to go to your settings, network, and internet, and then click on the status in the left pane. In the right pane, scroll down to click on view your network properties link. And then on this screen, scroll down to the details of your active network, whether it be an ethernet or wireless, and you'll see the IP address of your router listed as a default gateway. 
as you see here, default gateway 192.168.1.1. So lastly, the internet doesn't have to be scary. The best way to protect yourself online is to know what to expect. You want to take the time to understand some popular threats and learn how to avoid them. Think of your antivirus program as a safety net that will catch you if, you, if your safe browsing habits aren't enough. And remember these tips. Don't visit unsafe websites. Ignore any email from unknown senders. Protect your private information. Keep your email address out of the hands of predatory marketing companies. Keep your antivirus up to date. Perform routine virus scans. Don't keep passwords saved in document in a document on your computer. And change them regularly. Use a password manager. Reboot your modem and router at least twice a month. It's always easier to avoid danger when you know what to look for. With good habits and strong security software, you'll be able to browse safely, check on your loved ones, enjoy all the benefits of being connected. And here are some resources that we uh, use for this presentation. And now we're at the point where we can take questions. I'm going to stop my share. And everybody's probably uh, breathing a sigh of relief and says, God, that was long. <laughs> well, there was, there, there was a lot to, to, uh, to eat. Even I learned something today. So, Bill. Yeah, I hope everybody you. did. And uh, I will clarify anything that I misspoke if anybody has uh, uh, any issues or, that, or have something to add. That, I think that's what we want to do is get the discussion going. Well, okay. I have some questions. Uh, one of them is, a, the first is a comment from me, where he talked about, you know, putting your passwords together and things like that. Well, I always advocate, you know, really good, strong passwords. My password is so good and so strong that it absolutely drives us crazy. When he's trying to help me set up something, it, we failed with my um, Nest thermostat because it, we just threw up our hands and said, it's just, you know, do something else, Judy. And so I have a Honeywell. It was easier to set up than the Nest. And um, I have Ethernet for both my com computers and my TV because the Spectrum node is too far from me at the bottom of the hill, and the relay doesn't do me any good either. So uh, my wife, my home automation, all stuff is on Wi-Fi, and it's been, been dead in the water for the last two days, even though I have reset everything. So it is always fun dealing with all of this stuff, especially if you're semi-clueless. One last thing is I'm the, uh, a... Um, PowerPoint formatter. So we send this back and forth a couple of times. And I just would like to know, tell you, Bill, I am so happy about this. I have a gazillion ads for routers now and mesh routers on the news pages that come up like with Edge. Where, and, mm -hmm, yeah, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. So they are <laughs> looking at everything we are doing for sure. And to let everybody know for sure what we're doing is Judy has questions that have been submitted in the chat and we'll go through all of those first. And once the questions uh, are taken care of, then we'll open it up. So um, we'll let Judy take care of questions that have come in to her because she's the only one that asks questions until we open it up. Okay, so here we go. I was off my soapbox now. Uh, how can I set up a Wi-Fi SAN, S-A-N, using a cable modem with Ethernet and phone and Wi-Fi functions that can connect to Windows desktop, iPad, iPhone, eight terabyte and smaller external devices and have external cloud storage for shared drives? He wants to isolate his SAN from the cloud. 
Well, he would just have to use Ethernet uh, to do that. If if it's going to be, if anything is connected to the internet, then uh, the cloud is, well, that's going to be involved. I'm not sure if I totally understand the question, but just off the top of my head, I'm thinking you're going to have to use the ethernet method. But I will uh, research that and uh, send back um, a more definitive answer. That's what I was going to say. This will be one of the questions I send you. And then I'll send it out with all the follow-up material and everything. Uh, we travel with RV and many campgrounds say they have Wi-Fi, but it's usually weak and slow. Will any of this technology help us get a better connection inside our RV? Uh, nothing that I mentioned, but I can uh, um, recommend that you might go to the Verizon store. Apparently they have a new um, box that they're uh, selling that uh, is portable and that will connect uh, to, I guess their cellular um, towers and, prov and supposedly provide pretty good internet for people that are on the move. I can't remember what it's called, but it's a Verizon product that's fairly new. I think T-Mobile has something like that as well. So, um, or you can use, if you have <clears throat> a plan that will allow you to um, use your mobile phone as a um, hotspot, that's another way that you can use, uh, get better Wi-Fi, but that can be costly. Just for grins, I'm going to ask the geeks on tour, although they're in Italy now, uh, what they do, because they go from RV place to RV place giving presentations. And I can remember one of them, they ended up in a Walmart parking lot because that's where they got their best, <laughs> you know, connection to give a presentation to a group. Yeah, they would uh, be a really good uh, uh resource and I think they're using something that, uh, as to what I'm describing. We'll find out. Uh, I fondly remember being able to make phone calls using my contact list on my computer as you discussed being Hayes compatible. Is there a way to regain this functionality? Oh, I don't know. That put, that in that, put, put that in my... Uh, you get them all. Yeah. You can I'll have, to, I'll have to answer that uh, yeah. in writing. That's not marrying your phone with your PC, is it? No, that's, okay. uh, that's your PC, which is a function of Windows uh, 10 and 11. Okay. My ASUS router using the WPA2 standard is five years old and its latest firmware update is dated March, 2021. Its functionality is still excellent, but do you suggest I replace it because of security considerations? Well, right now I would say you're okay. Uh, the latest security we were talking about earlier was WPA2 and 3. Uh, the newer routers are, are, uh, have that in, uh, built in now, but the problem with WPA3, it's not uh, backwards compatible with older devices. So some um, of your Wi-Fi uh, devices can't connect to that. Uh, so the newer ones have a capability where they can uh, allow either using the WPA2 or WPA3 um, if you're um, on the newer routers. But I don't think at this point it's really um, economical unless you just want to go out and buy a new router to do so at this point. I think you're perfectly fine. I buy new routers because I, I just like to tinker. And so... Uh, and how did that go with the last one? It didn't go well. 
uh, and, and it didn't go well with the one I bought probably a year ago. I did the same thing. But anyway, uh, although I am very pleased with my new router, and it's a 6E, and uh, I do have some devices that connect to 6 and connect to 6E for that matter. So um, it's worked, and I'm using that mixed mode, with the WPA2 and WPA3, and I haven't had any connectivity problems uh, so far. And I counted that up from ballpark that you have uh, 10 devices hooked up to it. So you need to buy 20 more. Who, me? Yeah, you, because you- Oh, I have more than that. According to my phone, I have almost 30. Really? I've been, I, I only- uh, But I think those are based on the fact that I have, that, that includes uh, the numerous light bulbs or- Oh, I didn't think about the light bulbs, got that. Okay, somebody said what the name, oh, uh, does, please care, clarify 802.11ac, Wi-Fi 6 and 6E. Does 6 not have 6 gigahertz frequencies? Yeah, there, the, remember I said that um, the difference between 6 and 6E is that the E stands for extended. So they've extended the, uh, the, the bandwidth even further than what six is providing. And I forgot what the numbers were exactly, but that's what the E stands for. They both run on, they're both AX, 802.11AX. But um, the six E is the latest iteration and all they've done is just ex expand it the bandwidth even further than what it was on the original six. Uh, and the name of what you were looking for, uh, for the RV thing, someone said it's called Jet. Okay. Uh, Dave Melton says you can add an external antenna for your RV that will give you a cleaner signal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Kevin says Jetpack. M I F Y I eight eighty eight zero zero L that will be in the follow up material for everybody. And let us, oh, here's the one right here. Has anyone developed software to enable a laptop or phone to act as a mesh node? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay, let me check and see if I have any more here. All right, it's, we are open, oops, for uh, raising your hand with the reactions button and uh, for live Q&A. And I will read this last question while people are gathering their thoughts and finding out where the reactions button is. A five-year-old router is probably having some Components like power getting weaker with age that may be reducing its range and speed from what it was when it was new and upgrade may be a wise choice for performance reasons. Thank you for the comment. I am also would, um, that also would apply to, to modems as well. Um, you really should look at your modems. If you have um, a modem that you've had for more than five years, it's um, it's really obsolete. Yeah. Well, isn't it wise to get a new one when you stop getting patches? Because those are usually security patches. I haven't gotten one a security patch for my Netgear in over a year. I used to get them regularly. That would be. I would go to their um, website and see if there is any updates or what reason they are not sending up updates. Maybe it is out of the, their support. Uh, uh, Dave, unmute yourself, please, and ask your question. Hi there. Hey, Bill, great uh, presentation. My, Thank you. My ISP... Uh, pr uh, Internet service provider Comcast has changed my modem router to an XB7. I was having connectivity throughout the house 
I had gone to extenders, as you described, and then I went to a mesh. It helped. And then they advised that I needed, they were going to put this XB7 in, and I needed to remove the Eros mesh since it will cause a conflict with the XB7 they installed. Can you explain that? The XB7 modem router. Yeah, it's a combo. So um, the, the node, I guess, that um, you were using is not um, compatible with the main unit anymore. Did they not... Uh, did they not sell you or uh, provide you a, uh, anything or they're saying that the, your current, the, the new modem is capable of covering your whole house? Correct. At times there is some weakness, but prior to that, I had so many problems with connectivity and losing the ability throughout the house. A lot of the devices, would, you just watch the little circle spinning and so forth on the screens. And they finally, and. I was advised, go get a mesh uh, unit I would, with three uh, ex extenders on it. So I spread it out through the house and it, it helped tremendously. But I guess with the changes that Comcast was making, even that was not effective. Why did and they decide to, uh, to uh, change your router out if everything was working? Was, was everything working fine before they, they made the change? No, uh, it was it was intermittent, and so they came in, and we have the their modem router that's provided in the center of the house. But because I got three levels here, and I would have sections of the house I just had no signal. It was very weak when they walked around the house, and they said we have this new model, the XB7, which should take care of all your problems, but you have to remove the Eros mesh system so before we installed I so I discontinued that it seemed to have solved the problems but I was just wondering why they advised that yeah it's because the, the, the mesh units that you have are not compatible with the new one um, yeah it was a great unit you know and it's still working you know if I went gave it to someone else they usually know. say I don't know what your house is made of or the configuration but Usually, mesh uh, uh, a system will will uh, satisfy a lot of issues people have because you can uh, install these nodes on um, uh, multi levels and uh, get uh, good Wi Fi uh, on all floors on all levels. Cool. But if they're saying that new one is supposedly will replace all of that, you really wouldn't need to have those others because all it would do was just cause interference. Yeah, he said it would be creating conflicts and so forth. So I took it out before he installed the new unit, and it seems to be working very well. But I, I spent all the money for the mesh, and, and I, it made me wonder uh, what's going on here. It seems like every time they do some kind of an upgrade or a change, it just changes the whole dynamics. That's what happens when you are dealing with your different ISPs. Yeah. Uh, Dave yeah. also says a jet pack will use your mobile phone data. So bear in mind, if that's what you're gonna use when you're out with your RV, it's gonna cost you your right arm and left leg. How important it is, is it for all Wi-Fi components to be from the same maker, router, mesh, no. whatever, it makes no difference. Column no. A and column B is just fine. Just so they have the same, um... Um, that they're compatible with the, the modem is the only thing that you have a problem with. It has to be compatible with your ISP. Okay. I got a comment here. Wi-Fi originated in Australia, <laughs> a spinoff from radio astronomy research done by CSIRO. You never know what you're going to find out about at one of our Wednesday workshops. Marsha, you are on for your question. Okay, um, I have a DSL with CenturyLink, and it's kind of it's kind of a little on the oldish side. But they told me there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that I get a signal across it, weak signal sometimes when I'm trying to do um, uh, uh, 
video, you know, trying to do video chats. Would adding a router to that be helpful? It ha it's a modem with a built-in router, but I'm wondering if adding a router would help with the speed. We do have like app iPads, Apple phones that are all attached to it, computer, I mean, uh, printers. Well, um, you're asking, you have a DSL modem uh, combo router Yes. You wouldn't, you wouldn't need to add a second router to that unless you want to separate the two devices and get a separate DSL modem and then add a, 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 a another router, which would be one that you, of your choosing that you would purchase. And being the technology has improved, it might be a better, uh, it might add some improvement, but there's no real guarantee. Um, but how old is your how old is your uh, your DSL modem? I think you said five years. I think it's that five years, yeah. And what's the company? Uh, it's through CenturyLink. CenturyLink. That was one that I showed. Uh, it had a yeah. They had a DSL modem. Yes. Uh, Do you have an office where you can go physically in? To yes. It Yes. I'd unplug it and take it in and ask for the newest model. That's what I do with Time Warner and Spectrum. Okay. I'd have to buy it. It's uh, about 200 bucks. They already told me that if I wanted a new one. Oh, gosh. Well, you know, you can, uh, you don't necessarily have to buy it from them. You could go uh, and shop elsewhere, just as long as it's compatible with CenturyLink. And then when you get the new box, just call them and tell them you have a new modem and they can uh, 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 assign it to your account. So you might be able to find one cheaper for, on Amazon. Okay. I'll try. Yeah, you might want to ask them first if you have any problems with it are they the ones that are going to help you with it if you buy your own? Ty, uh, Spectrum was more than happy to do that for me, but I don't know that other ISPs will do that. Oh, that's a good usually, point. Yeah, usually they won't, I mean, um, because it's not their equipment. Mm -hmm. But, um, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean if, you know, if it's if the line goes out, you still they still have to come out and fix that. But if something physically goes wrong with the box, you know, like if uh, it um, burns up or whatever, they won't take care of any of that. Over to you, Joel. You're on. Please unmute. Okay, uh, several things. I've been through a whole series of, of uh, things on Wi-Fi on my house over the last 10 years. Uh, I have a peculiar house in that the um, two extremes of the house. My wife's stuff is upstairs in one corner of the house, and my stuff is downstairs in the opposite corner of the house. And the pathway from any reasonable place to seem to put the, uh, the uh, Wi-Fi router has to go through exterior brick walls to get between places. So I've gone through all sorts of things. Extenders didn't work well. I've used multiple routers because I have a wired Ethernet between my office and the upstairs office. And so I was able to put a wired uh, router upstairs and went with that for a while, but you just then have the problem of switching between networks when you walk around the house with iPhones. Uh, so that didn't work too well. Uh, Cox upgraded from 100 to uh, 150 megabits per second. And I was only getting 120. And I was getting that instantly on both the Wi-Fi ground stairs as well as on the wired um, Ethernet. And I upgraded my gigabit router, Wi-Fi router, to a faster router. And now I suddenly get 150. Basically, even though it's a gigabit router and says it supports speeds, aggregate speeds that are in excess of what your uh, ISP provides, 
you can still have other performance problems inside those routers, which lower your speed. Uh, my guess from the evidence is that it was having insufficient buffers to keep up with the traffic because I would start out, I would get 150 megabits and then it would sort of drop off to 120. Uh, so apparently it was running out. But anyway, the mesh routers have solved that problem totally for my house. Uh, I now get the 150 megabits per second on suitable Wi-Fi devices as well as on the ethernet wired. Um, and so that's been a great way to go. Uh, some other comments, so um, if you're going to have your own routers, your own Wi-Fi routers, you don't want to have any combo routers from your provider because that upsets the whole works there. You don't want an independent router trying to get in the picture that you can't control or which might be changed in technology. Typically, if you get a Wi-Fi router out on your own, you're going to get one that's more recent technology than what you're going to get from your ISP. Your ISP has to test it out and integrate it with their system. By the time they start sending it out to customers, it's probably obsolete already. So I would highly recommend that you get a separate modem from your provider and you provide your own Wi-Fi uh, router so that you can completely control your in-house system yourself and not be subject to their whims. Um, I would agree. <clears throat> also, if your internet service provider normally provides you with a modem and you buy your own, they should reduce their monthly rental. Cox will reduce your rental by $5 a month if you have your own modem. But you have to ask for it. Yeah, you um, pay a rental fee uh, for your... Um to them for your devices that they um, provide you. Right, right, which may be higher if you have a Wi-Fi router that's supposed to be all house uh, uh, coverage, but even just the modem, if you just get the modem from them, that's a $5 a month fee from Cox, but they don't tell you that. Uh, but if you, for some reason, want to provide your own, and our computer club actually has our own modem, uh, we had to explicitly go in and get them to recognize that and take $5 off our monthly rental. Good to know. I don't think I've done, I, I know I got um, a, um, re, re, I, I, I stopped the rental from my uh, router that I had got from Cox, but I also own my own modem, but I didn't get, I don't think I'm getting any credit for that. I have to check into that. Thanks, Joel. Yeah. I think one of the reasons that the computer club did that a number of years in the past was because uh, they wanted to get one combined uh, modem and router. Um, having experienced that for several years, I would say that's probably not as good as a separate modem and a separate router, simply because the firmware seems to have bugs in it. And when you start combining things into the same firmware, uh, there seem to be more bugs. <laughs> I had Spectrum out for four hours uh, about a year and a half ago. And I had my house completely rewrapped and a new connection that's right over here within four feet of me, uh, drilled it through from the back bedroom that was the office. And that worked really well. Uh, and they worked and they worked and they worked. And then all of a sudden the light bulb went on and the tech went into my laptop and he said, because I paid for 200, that's our standard. And I couldn't get anything, a 96 was mine. And he just, the light bulb went on. Well, I had a network card with the Dell laptop that was only rated for 100. So I would never get anything over 100. And when I called Dell and complained, according to them, 100 was just fine. Well, I certainly <laughs> think it was fine. So I have this HP desktop now that is a zinger. John Metcalf, you're on. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, I'm just going to comment. Um, Judy and I share the same ISP because we we live pretty close to each other, and um, they. I was using a combined modem, router, and Aris, 
and it uh, had it for about five or six years, and it um, it was going bad on me or something. Anyway, I had always had my own because uh, Spectrum, uh, you know, they charge rent on um, about ten bucks a month, as I recall, for the for for their modem. Uh, they've since told me that they no longer charge rent. But anyway, I got a new modem uh, from Netgear in October. In November, I got a new router also from Netgear. And I was having all kinds of problems. Judy remembers this. And uh, it turned out the technicians came out and they said, well, we don't have enough nodes. There's too many people on the system. You yep. know what I'm talking about. Yep. So. I kept hounding them and they started to threaten to charge me $60 to come out every time they sent a technician out. <laughs> um, anyway, one day, about two months later, all of a sudden I lost all service for nearly a day. Mm -hmm. And the next day it came back on. Bingo, I got everything. I'm getting 450 download. Mm -hmm. my, my contract says 400. I'm getting 450. I've got a discount of $20 off that for a few more months, and then it goes up $20. But um, the point I'm making, I guess, is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You've heard that old saying. Mm -hmm. You're laughing. No, I am, because it also depends on where you live in the Santa Clarita Valley. John and I live on the 14th side, that is the east side. We are the only area with more population than any. <clears throat> we have less nodes over here than the center and the west side and the south side. We just all, we always say we are the forgotten side of town. And even with spectrum in the nodes, we are. John Kennedy, you have something to ask. Or I have something to, to contribute. Yes, you know, I am also a, a, a spectrum, but I think we are a stepchild because they See? ended up getting us and uh, we don't uh, pay for modem. It's, it's not an extra charge, but nothing's free. So it's in the cost of the modem, which this month went up for me. But, you know, my concern is that you guys are keep talking about buying this and buying that and whatever. Well, when it goes bad, like Marsha, she's talking about a $200 uh, new DSL modem. But if you stick with, with um, your ISP, if something goes bad, they replace it. No money out of my pocket. So, you know, why, why would I want to go out and buy my own modem? And why would I go out and, you know, buy my own router when they replace it when it goes bad instead of my pocketbook? Well, one of the reasons, John, that I rather go that route because I have a manual that comes with it and I can go in and troubleshoot when I have the, uh, the, the um, rely on the ISP, I have to call them and they have to do all the troubleshooting and normally, you know, that takes time and I don't always agree with what they're doing. So I just rather do it myself. And the way I can do that, I have my own my own equipment and I can troubleshoot it myself. Yeah, and but if it, so far I've never had a problem with that. But, but I know if it goes bad, a, if it goes bad, you're gonna have to cash out money and replace it. Well, that's true, but um, I haven't had a router go bad. I just had them go obsolete. I've never had one that actually, you know, just well, if, if mine goes obsolete, they're going to replace it with no money out of my pocket either. Well, that's, and I agree with you. I mean, that you have to make those those kinds of decisions, but I just prefer to fix my own stuff. I mean, I, I, uh, I've done it for years and I, I haven't had um, uh, to rely on the ISP to come out and fix it. And every time I've called them, you know, I, I'll say, well, I'm having this kind of difficulty. And they'll tell me, well, you need, uh, it's on your end. And yeah. even, even it's with their equipment. So if it's going to be on my end, I'm going to be able to, but I can't fix it. I mean, I can't do anything because 
I don't have any manual. I remember when they came out and brought, that's the first time I actually rented some equipment. That's when I got the uh, gigabyte system that Cox was offering. And I wanted to um, have the guy, I said, can you set the, uh, my uh, SSID to the same name that I had on my old equipment and do some other things? He said he couldn't do it. Hmm. And so I had to get in and do it myself. I managed to figure out how to get into the router to change it. But I mean, Cox wasn't trying to help me. And I thought about doing it, you know, um, even back in the days when we were charged like $10 a month. And I said, well, if I buy my own, you know, modem and stuff uh, and save $10 a month, that's in one year, I'll have $120, which might have been the cost of the modem. So it's going to take me a year just to break even. And then I start saving money. But then if the modem goes bad, then I got to go out and buy again. And so... I look at that in the in the money side because that's. Well, I suppose you could. I mean, if you if you uh, elect to go back to, they'll give you another modem. You know, if you decide that you don't want to buy another one. Yeah, just kind of money out of my pocket that I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Over to Marsha for another question. Unmute, please. I'm going to call CenturyLink and see about if I can rent one from them just to give it a try or something. Um, I didn't know they had an option that I could rent or buy. But I the question I have is when I uh, log on, it often says I have weak security. So I don't have a very strong password or uh, login to make it simple. Uh, my signal doesn't get very far outside of my house. So am I okay that way? No, huh? <laughs> no, I don't. Oh. Um, I don't understand why your your computer, was, it has no way of knowing that you have weak security on your router. Oh, yeah. Mine does and tells me that. Yeah, yeah. it's it's mostly the iPhones and the uh, and the iPad that tells me that. <laughs> Hey, that fantastically rotten, miserable password that I have, I never get those messages. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I don't think, well, that's interesting. I'm not, I, that's the first of my hearing of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for I, sharing. I don't mind having weak security if it isn't, if, I, if the danger can't come from the internet itself to get through my weak security. If it just can come because somebody's parked on the curb, I'm not going to have to worry about that. Isn't that the way the hackers would get into her email program and steal stuff and everything? I, I don't know. I mean, I... Well, the password is the, is the key thing. If it's yeah. a weak password, that's what you get in. Yeah, and they is that what is Is that what it's fussing about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually. Says, yeah. Weak password usually means you're using the default password, which is available on the internet. And if that's the case, you want to make sure you change it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first thing you do when you install any of your modem router. You change it to your own password. A friend of mine, they said, oh, please, AT&T. You know, you know, Judy says I should change this. And they said, please don't. When we come to your house to work on it or anything, uh, you know, we immediately were in and her modem was on the outside of a cupboard in her kitchen. And there was the password information that they wanted her to keep. And I said, hey, I said, you change it. They come out, you give it to them. And I said, the minute they walk out the door, you change it again. I listen to what Bob says. What can I tell you? Yeah, I'm, I know on the, on the Cox um equipment the um the uh, password is underneath the router yeah and yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you can change that or not for them i mean i don't do i mean i you don't can. have a oh. yeah you can mm -hmm. you have to know how to get inside of it to do it one of the yeah. other things that that comes up too is even though if you change your password if you use a password that doesn't meet today's recommended standards of capitals lower this and that then they'll always say that you have a weak password mm -hmm. 
even if it's a pretty good password, if it doesn't meet the top standard. Can I? That, that can may I be ask, what's going on. Because I asked somebody as to their best router for v VPN. Has anybody done a research on VPN routers? I haven't. Um, I don't use a VPN, but um, Bob is probably better to ask. No, he's shaking his head. Um, I use a VPN when I'm away from home on an unsecured network. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, I don't want a VPN. It's only going to slow me down because it has an extra step with encryption. So, Steve, are you where are you located? Outside Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. Okay, and so, um, I'm a security nerd. Okay, I want VPN, and there's a routers out there that have VPN, and you can build the VPN into the router, so you don't have to do VPN for every device. Correct. Okay, I, I'm not familiar with those. Okay. Next um, question. Uh, what about 6G? What's going to happen to the routers when 6G hits the fan in about three years? When 6, uh, Wi-Fi 6 or 6G? Yeah, you're muted. I think he's talking about cell phones, 6G cell yeah. phones. You're routed, Steve. You're muted. You're muted. Well, why don't we move on to those that have their hands up with yeah, questions. Kevin. Okay, yeah, I, 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 when I heard Marsha's story and talking about, and then other people talking about having your own router and stuff, and then all these things, uh, it prompted a whole bunch of stuff. Marsha, are, are you in a um, place that has an older copper phone line running to your house? Who knows? Yeah, I, yeah. yeah um, I, don't, I don't know. The house was built in the 80s. Okay, so with, with CenturyLink, sometimes they're limited to the speed they can give you based on the in infrastructure they've got. So if they still only have old copper in your neighborhood, you're going to be limited. And so if you get this super duper thing, you, you won't be able to get the speed anyway. Um, the security, uh, I think on that, you probably have a Zixel modem. Uh, that's what CenturyLink uses a lot of in our, in our neck of the woods. I don't know if they do the same where you are. I'm in the central Florida area. Um, and they, I think that password is like a, an eight character upper uh, lowercase uh, password. Um, and yes, it can be changed, but like, like Bill was saying, it's your responsibility to go in there. The Zixel routers, I think you can access that with the techniques that Bill gave us today, you can go into the IP address and the password for the uh, uh, administrative login are on the Zixel routers. Uh, that's pretty clear. So just like Bill said, go into the 192, well, 192.168.0.1 .0 .1 or the 10.0.0.1, uh, and then you'll be able to get to the place for Wi-Fi settings and all that. Um, the uh, on the rolling your own, kind of having your own cable modem and router. Um, with Spectrum, I found lately, um, and Comcast, uh, I, I have Spectrum where I physically am, but I have a lot of people I deal with that have Comcast. And they're locking this ability to get into the details of the, the, the cable modem slash gateway box more and more. So you have to go through their app. And I haven't seen where I've been able to go all over the place in the app. You can change the password, you can change, um, uh, you can change the SSID. Um, I'm not sure how much other stuff I can change using their app, uh, but you can change those things. Um, you used to be able to get a manual for their routers uh, so that even if you just had an XP7 router, you could still go in and uh, log in Bill, like you were saying, and you could go in and get a manual from the internet somewhere from the manufacturer and make those changes. Um, now, even if you have the manual, if you're not going through their app, uh, you get blocked on, on some of these things. 
Uh, let's see, 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 see. I put a link in the chat box to uh, Best Buy modems with uh, routers with VPNs. It will, the left. it will be in the follow up material. And I also have a uh, quote to improve the security of your Wi Fi network, change the administrative password on your router. Preferably after installing the unit, this is what Bob G said, you'll need to log into the router console with its current password, locate the settings to change the router password, then choose a new strong password. Everybody right. should do that instantly when they are installing this kind of equipment. You don't want the bad guys getting in. Well, right. I think that's what Kevin's talking about now that that's kind of problematic. But go on. I just wanted to make it clear because I know we've got a broad range of people on the call. Um, the, the passwords we're talking about, there's one password, the administrative password that we're talking about changing all the time as soon as you get it, is the password that allows you to have administrative control over the router device itself where you can make internal changes to the router. The Wi-Fi password is the password you use when you want to connect a device to the router and then access the internet through that. Um, and you want both of those to be secure, um, but most, most routers these days have a unique password on the label that is different than the label on your neighbor's device, which is different than the label on that neighbor's device. I don't know if we can consider those extremely secure. A lot of times they use two English words separated by a four digit number. And I, personally, I think the verdict is out as to how secure that is. I think the number of characters you have is a significant um, metric in this. The more characters you have, the harder it's gonna be to break. However, if you're just using two words from the dictionary, how many words do we have in the dictionary? How fast do our computers run? How long does it take to go through that? You know, So it's a lot, but if you've got a computer that all it's doing all day is hacking at that, they can break through. Thank you so much. That's it. Um, I have a comment, Judy, if I may. Somehow I dropped out of the sequence there. I had my hand up. but yeah, Thanks. Appreciate that. If I may make a comment. Yep. Sherry, um, your turn. All right. Let me drop my hand now. Um, actually, I'll break down and put my cell phone. Oh, there's there. the real you in Arizona. Yes, yes. And it's going to be 100 here today. So uh, probably the first first day, 100 degrees. Um, regarding passwords, yes, the National Institute of Standards and Technology used to be the NBS for you old timers. Uh, they have now had a, an epiphany about passwords. And I have a close friend that tracks this. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, this whole thing about having rules, you have to have one of those, you have to have an upper or lower, those rules make passwords weaker, <laughs> not stronger. Now, but that, but they help because a lot of people want to pick their dog's name or something. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> so, so anyway, like the guy that his password got hacked, so he had to kill his dog. And okay. Anyway, um, so, <clears throat> That's a reality. And what you said, the other thing I wanted to say is um, one should change the default password on any device that you get. Uh, even, you know, even a, I tend to do it if it's not even connected to the internet, although anything that's, that's online should be changed. And I, my passwords are 12 characters minimum, and they're just absolute random jumbles of percents and uppercases and, and, and bangs and and, and but that's impossible to remember, but I have a password vault. That's what you have to use. So, so you go down, you find it, you copy it out, paste it in. And then that means you've got this incredibly strong password for everything that you do. Now back to Marsha, I use CenturyLink. I have a, and somebody else said they did. I've got a C4000LG. I just bought that from CenturyLink. I wasn't aware, I, I don't think they gave me an option to rent. But I bought it anyway. Uh, so uh, I bought it from them. I did go online and find the device. Um, Bill's right. You can buy a lot of those things online. Just put them on them yourself. But I bought it from them because that way I can say, well, this thing just quit and you sold it to me, you know. So I have some, some thing to go back to CenturyLink. So anyway, that's 
And of course, one last thing, uh, the router, the CenturyLink modem, that, that, that the DSL modem has, uh, has, a, has a, a router built in it. It's got four uh, network ports on the back of it. So that means it's got a router built in. You don't need another router downstream from that. However, I do have a Linksys device inserted between the CenturyLink router, DSL router, and my computer. I never connect my computer naked to the internet. It's got to have some kind of firewall or protection device between it and the internet. And this little tiny Linksys box, which is getting so old and I'm gonna to have to replace it. What the main thing it does is reject un, um, random attempts to connect to my machine from the internet. So, uh, and that, that's really, really a nice thing to have. Plus it's got lights on it. So they flicker, I know that my internet is active. See, it. so anyway, I guess that's uh, that's all uh, everything I was trying to say. So I've been very happy; it's been working just fine, CenturyLink. Uh, you know, and you're right; I paid like two hundred, and they charged me two hundred and fifty dollars or something for that that uh, DSL mode. But uh, I guess that's it. Thank you for listening, and I'll turn it back to you, Jerry. Uh, what password manager do you use? And you are obviously using the ones that it generates. No. Oh, Yo, you're coming up here with your own convolution. Yeah, I just take the keyboard and, and go all over it, tap various keys. I have a password manager built in. I use a feature of Outlook that allows me to keep a list of passwords. I'm not using a, a, a password manager program per se, but I do recommend those. There's, there's oh, I forgot, fast pass. There's, there's four or five of them that are, Bob may know some of them that are, that are, that are uh, you know, password manager program. I, I found a feature of Outlook that allows to, to, you can put notes in it. And uh, so I, I have buried way down in there and encrypted, I have my, my password list. And to be able to take, to use 12, 14, 15 character passwords and nothing but random jumbles of letters and numbers and percent signs, you, you can't possibly do that without a password manager. Because you can, you, you don't want to write them down. Because and and you, so that enables me to use those long passwords. So, thank you so much. Appreciate it, uh, David. It's your turn, but you're not going to get any of the follow-up material because I don't know your last name. And as I my chat to you said, we have several Davids who have registered. So please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, when, when, I, when I first joined and it asked me my name and I said, okay, and as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, it's supposed to put my last name and I haven't figured out because I'm using my phone how to add my last name. So I'm sorry about that. What is it? K-A-Y-N is in Nancy E. Got it, I'll fix it. Thank you. Um, Frontier just came into our neighborhood with um, yeah. fiber, optics. fiber optics, and so they'll they'll hook they'll hook up directly into your house and and set up one Ethernet thing. Um, but we've lived here for twenty two years and we've always had Spectrum, so I have my email address Ooh. at charter.net, and when I called them about canceling they said well you lose your you lose your email address immediately and they don't seem to offer what happened he's muted there now he's back yeah phone call came in um what, what was i saying oh yeah so you lose your they don't even offer something where if someone emails you at your charter address saying you've moved to a new address. Anybody have any solutions for that other than, uh, the other thing I was thinking of doing was with Spectrum either reducing it to the lowest speed or telling them um, um, traveling <laughs> the world and putting, and putting it on suspense for nine months while you still get to uh, keep your, e your email address. Are you a member of the IEEE or the ACM? 
No, okay. If well, I don't know what you mean, I would have to say no. Association for Computer and Machinery or the IEEE uh, Electronics Engineers. I, what I, the point I'm making is both of those, I'm a member of both. They offer a free alias service. In other words, my mailing address is at computer.org. That's the IEEE alias service. The mail goes there and then gets sent to, to my actual email. So if, if, in, if you can find one of those services in the future, you can, if anybody else on this call, you can avoid that problem by, the reason I have that is because if I change, I'm on Gmail now, I'm not likely to change it. But if I do, I don't have to change my email address. I just go out to the alias server, log in and say, okay, don't send them here, send them there. So, so having those alias servers, and again, I, I don't know if there's any, I don't know of any other organizations, but there must be some that, that, uh, that provide that. I the, alias, the alias services, what email address do you give out? Your Gmail or the alias service? No, the alias server address. That's the point. Uh, Jerry.crow at computer.org. Computer.org is a, is a computer, is, is the IEEE alias server. My email goes there and the, looks, the server looks it up and says, where should I really put this? And sends it immediately to Gmail. But then if I, if I change my Gmail address or change my email account someplace, I don't have to change anything. I go out to IEEE and say, okay, send it over here now. Right, but if everybody has my charter email address and I had this- Oh, no, no, this is not gonna, I'm sorry, David. This is not gonna resolve your current problem, okay? Thank you. This is how you could, but what I would do is send an email out to everybody in my contact list and say, um, this email address is dead within 45 days or whatever. Please don't use it forevermore. Use whatever it is. You could set up your alias like uh, Jerry was saying and send them the new uh, address and boom. Yeah, but and clearly I should not pick one with Frontier for whenever I switch to them. Right, so but you, gonna... could do an, you could do an alias like, there's other yeah. companies other than triple, IEEE that does this for you. But yeah, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. the only solution that I can think of. Get, a, web, web, get a web-based mail. Yeah, a web-based. Uh, people email. And it's their loss. Hot mail. There are so many, so many internet access uh, points that you can use, and they don't change when you change your internet service provider. Yeah. No, I have I have Yahoo for the crap email, and then um, <laughs> uh, Yahoo would never mind. Don't want to get into it. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, there's there's another, and as Judy would say, it never goes away even after you die unless you know how to take care of that. Right, and I always told my students have your good email address and then your throwaway, and that's a better description for his Yahoo address, <laughs> but also known as crappy stuff. But um, yeah, contacts, send them two or three emails over time and boom, shut it down. Thank you. Can you lower my hand for me? Uh, yeah, John will take care of that. Yeah. Thank you. Joel, you're on. Uh, yeah. Um... Several comments. One of, uh, if the only reason why you want a VPN is to uh, secure your link when you're on unsecured Wi Fi, uh, then there are also various VPN services you can get. Or if you happen to already have a Malbytes uh, license, uh, they include a VPN service with that. So you can use their VPN when you're on unsecured Wi Fi, and at least that protects the stuff that you have that's on the unsecured Wi-Fi. The stuff that goes from their VPN service to whoever you're talking to is secured, provided you're using uh, secure HTTP, HTTPS uh, service. So if it's otherwise secured, once you get logged into the place, uh, it's still secured even from that link as well. Uh, I've never got warned that my Wi-Fi password was insecure. When the WPA2 first came out, I said, oh, well, how can I use uh, this facility? Uh, I have this, this poem that has a nice phrase that I can remember. My password is 60 characters long. I'm a speed typer, so it's great on a laptop or a computer. But gosh, one of these smart TVs, we got to move the cursor. It's a real pain. But I've got enough devices to have it that 
it's always been a pain to change it too, so I still have it. I do have a guest network divine with a smaller password. Um, one problem I have oh, on the email, you know, if you have to change the email uh, and your old providers is going to disappear before you can inform people about the new ones, uh, you could also go to a temporary Gmail account or something like that. And if you use Thunderbird as an email client and IMAP to connect to both those accounts, you can move all your email from one to another, even in the uh, other various folders that you may have. Um, one problem I've had with Cox a couple of times is we've been about service uh, for over a day on several occasions. Uh, once they had some really peculiar problem in their network where they had some bad amplifiers that they just couldn't drag down. And every time the weather got wet, uh, the service would go out. And then, of course, when they got out to look at it, it was in working again. And then somebody dug up some fiber somewhere uh, a couple miles away and, and wiped things out for several towns. So I started looking at alternatives. And, you know, the iPhone hotspot is nice for devices that connect with Wi-Fi. But what do you do about Ethernet-connected devices in your house? I found a way to load an operating system on Raspberry Pi and have that connect by Wi-Fi to an iPhone hotspot and then bridge the Wi-Fi to the ethernet connection on the Raspberry Pi. And I can hook that into my router and drive the whole house off of it if I need to. You gotta be careful and not use too much data because you've got you know, serious data limits on an iPhone. But if you're just doing email and if some casual browsing, uh, you can drive the whole house off of an iPhone hotspot uh, that way. Um, and initially I, I didn't get that great of uh, service because uh, my Raspberry Pi was back level and it only supported the uh, older uh, Wi-Fi conventions. And I also thought, well, my iPhone was back level. I need to upgrade my iPhone. So I upgraded my iPhone from a, a 7 up to a, a, a 13, I think. And turned out the Raspberry Wi-Fi didn't support the iPhone's Wi-Fi. So I had to get a new Wi-Fi thing for the Raspberry. But I can drive that interface now at uh, 37 uh, megabits per second. It's amazing what you can do with those okay. little raspberries. When you get desperate, you know, and have time to think about it because the internet's not working. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, a very excellent uh, comment about my send an email out to everybody in the free world and your contact list and tell them you're moving on. Uh, don't forget if you have used that email address for recovery, password recovery, you need to go in and change that because I have my two, my email address from 2003. The account is for every single recovery that I do. And uh, I tell my uh, digital executor kiddo, that's the last thing you ever want to close for mom. <laughs> that and my phone, just keep them going for a little while. And when Cablevision changed to Time Warner, um, I got my SoCal.RR.com email address and I thought I need another email address like I have a hole in my head. So I sent me, myself all these emails until these that said, I'm sorry, you know, it's full. And people would say, why aren't you getting, e you know, I sent you an email and it says, you know, I couldn't, blah. and I said, that's because I don't want to use that email address and I know it's out there. So tough. Uh, Bill, you're on. Yes, uh, I, I find it uh, in, in interesting that uh, so far I haven't heard anybody say they have my provider, which is the infamous AT&T. <laughs> oh, that sucks. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I just found it like, well, are they the Death Star or what, you know? Um, does anybody have any? I, for, I have a couple of questions. And one of them, does anybody have any ideas of, of AT&T versus Spectrum? Spectrum is really pushing the hard press in the Milwaukee area, you know, and, and actually my church had to add a Spectrum line 
booked in order to do our uh, live streaming for our service because AT&T couldn't provide the speed we needed or whatever to do live streaming successfully. Um, and, uh, I, and one reason I've kind of stayed with AT&T is because I also like the convenience of having a landline option. So I, so I, I have my, I use a landline with my phone number, but, uh, um, and, uh, but, but I'm looking at, at this router and, in a modem fan. I, I have the same thing combo unit that they installed back in, I guess it's three, four years ago is, I, I don't even know if they if they charge me or not. Uh, I guess I got to lean on them um, because I've never, I don't, I mean, I get an auto, no, a digital bill and I don't see the charge on it. Is, is uh, do you know anything about AT&T? Like I said, I, I see both sides of the coin in the Milwaukee computer group as far as people who like it and don't like it. And and I'm going like, well, you know, I can't, can't have any, uh, I guess I don't have any complaints necessarily. Uh, and then the last one is I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one of those frugal guys, you know, that, that don't like buying stuff if I don't have to. And, and I don't like renting forever either. Uh, but I'm, I've, uh, I'm looking at getting rid of one of my still standard CRT TVs with a, with a secret decoder ring box onto it and getting a smart TV. Is there is there a, a, a minimum speed uh, that I need for uh, a smart TV? And two, um, is is there do I need to consider changing over to the modem? I mean, I have an all wood frame duplex that I live in, so th there's there's nothing around me brick to you know to blow black me out of anything. So a couple of questions, but. My thing is, is everybody that I know that has AT&T hates it, you know, this next door thing, and they'll be talking about it like crazy. But then on the other hand, the, the people hate Spectrum. I just know that I helped a, a gal with her phone and her access. And the, the AT&T uh, tech lied to me. And if it had been her, she would have done what he said because she's clueless. And uh, she was having problems with her email. And unbeknownst to us, he opened a new email account for her, closed her longtime email account. And after I said, thank you very much, you know, you know, I'm out of here. And we went into her old account and it was dead in a doornail. I happened to get him when I called back and you can imagine how I tore him apart. How could he do that without saying anything? And he didn't find anything wrong with it. And I've had a couple of other uh, tech people and they, they suck big time. My Spectrum people and Time Warner people um, always give good stuff. And if they don't, I just ask for another one. If the church already changed over, what are you waiting for? Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I have a landline with at and and so I'm looking at like, uh, you know, do, am I getting rid of it? Spectrum doesn't advertise that. They have VOIP. I've had Spectrum VO, VOIP for probably five years. But of course, if you live where I am um, and the fire comes by, uh, Edison shuts all our power off and I don't have any phone service except for my smartphone. Well, see, that's what I like about a landline. But of course, in, in downtown Milwaukee, you don't necessarily lose power, but it does happen, you know. You might want to check and see where they are on the, the scale of things, because I, I have read many articles that said their landlines will eventually go away. And they, oh, the AT&T the AT ones? Yeah. Oh, so okay. Just, just for grins, you might want to check that out and see if I'm blowing smoke or not. Okay, and what about what about uh, this uh, a modem and combo thing? Um, I suppose I should check in and find out whether if I'm paying AT and T for it or not. I mean, it's I don't have to worry about 
the bulb would frame up problems, but with going through going with TV, uh, is does that affect uh, the quality of service? Of because well, I mean I'm I'm even Wi-Fi on my on my laptop. I don't have anything Etherneted in. Uh, I didn't even think about that. My Visio works just fine. It's worked fine through Time Warner and now Spectrum. I do have to share with you that the Spectrum employees hate the company and they much prefer Time Warner. Oh, oh the whole Spectrum people hate Time Warner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they took, a lot, they took a lot of their bennies away, the whole nine yards, and they're putting some of the benefits back that they took away. Yeah. Well, they got oh. to. I mean, we're most of us are retired and, you know, uh, Benny's are things that kind of went away and now slowly that $12 or $15 an hour uh, minimum wage is making a lot of people rethink things. Oh gosh, we make yeah. twice that in California. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Judy, Judy, one thing on, on you, you know, talked about your Vizio TV. Uh, you're running 400, aren't you? Or 200. Oh, oh heavens no. I remember I was running 100 because that's all but, no, on your but but your your internet that came through to your TV, your, your smart TV. I'm Etherneted. Oh, to the to the TV. Yeah. yeah, but your your provider to be different as to what he's getting with AT and T, because uh, there will, is a level that you need to be to get good streaming. Yeah, well, I used to be 100, and then they automatically went up to 200, and it was the same charge. Right. John the same with me. I was looking, uh, John, I was looking here. Um, I don't know. I'm surprised by the recommended speeds. They're saying for a standard, it it's three uh, plus megabytes per second. If it's HD, it's five to 13 plus. And for 4K, it's 16 to 25. Those numbers seem awfully low to me. Yeah. But that's what they said, the recommended ones. But uh, I would say um, you should at least be getting uh, anywhere from 150 to 200 to have a, a, a better. Of course, Bob is shaking his head. Bob, what do you say? Hold on. I get 40 down and I have no problems getting my stuff on YouTube through my TV. Yep. Okay, so the, maybe these, I'm going to put these numbers in the chat. Yeah, they're, so not, they're not as high as you think, Bill. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, because I got the same reception with I, when I got 96 as I get with 236. But, but if I go if I go to Spectrum, are they going to give me a, 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 a combo unit or am I going to get a... a You're going to decide yourself, your choice. Okay. And There's then no, no, the combo every, couple of, every couple of years, take it in and say, hi there. Judy told me from SoCal that I should turn this in for the latest version of your hardware. Works for me. Of course, but my daughter, my daughter-in-law was the head person of Time Warner districts up here, and my son worked for the company for years. But still, the people Bill, they'll work there. Hi, you know, you're here to return your uh -huh. they, Bill, they a lot yes, of the ATT people in Columbus are getting switched over to fiber. And they're getting more speed. Okay. Yeah, I got to check to see because it was installed for some years ago. And they had to put, run a separate line from the pole over to my place. So I'm not even sure what I got. You need to call them and find out. And if you're not getting straight answers, just ask for another person. Yeah. Trans my mantra is transfer me to a supervisor. Yeah, I know. I, I When I was doing customer support for my corporation, you know, when I get these these corporations calling up i'd always say look i want to talk to your manager and they they look at me like no 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 no. i i i've dealt with people i want i know i know i know you're paid a dollar 95 an hour i'm sorry for it i really need to talk to your person above you i mean this is about food and food and liabilities and stuff like that some people go, oh, I, I, I got to the top you got it all over and john says we have three more questions and then we're out of here so, Gregory, it's your turn. Okay, it's actually a comment. You were talking on the modem uh, provider modem combos. I've been running my uh, own network for years, 15, 20. And what I've done is just shut off the 
router on the combo modem and, and use my own router. How true. It works fine. You don't have any complications with the that gives you separation. On ours, we have Spectrum, and we told them we didn't want their Wi-Fi, and the box they had given us had the Wi-Fi built in. So they disabled the Wi-Fi and subtracted, I think it was five or ten bucks a month from our bill. They and we have our own, we have our own Netgear router. Yeah, they can do that online with no problem at all. They can turn the switches on or off. Okay, Gabe. I don't trust them. I'll do it myself. Hi, just a couple of comments. One on changing your email address. Don't forget all the businesses where you've registered your email address to make sure you update that. And uh, I keep a record of where I've done that. And so if I need, same as registering credit cards. So if I need to change either one, I can, I can go ahead and do that. Uh, another alternative to having an email forwarder is to have your own domain. So my domain is gabegold.com and I can have as many addresses on that as I want. And if I get tired of using one, I can use another and I can forward from one to the other. So having your own domain is a very small yearly expense and it just it isolates you from your ISP and from anybody else. You're basically uh, doing your own domain management and it's not much of a challenge. Um, talking about a smart TV being online and IoT devices being online in general, I'm very conservative about what I put online. So I have a smart TV that I bought two or three years ago that I use just as a TV. It doesn't need to be online. Every six months or so, it whines that it lost to be online to look for updates and do all kinds of other things. Uh, but it's working just fine as a TV. And, and so that's what I use it for. We have a fancy garage door opener that I found out could go online. I could put it on my Wi-Fi network and then remotely from an app, I could check whether the door is open or closed or I could control it remotely. And I said, I'm not going to do that because if I can access the door, uh, who else can, can access the door? And I think I had another comment, but I have forgotten it. So I will yield my time back. Larry, you are our last question. Take it away. Uh, speaking of passwords, I, I wanted to find out if there were any recommendations for hardware multi-factor authentication, since apparently uh, it's, it's not a good idea to use SMS texting for multi-factor. Uh, SMS has been moved to, hmm, I think it's RCS. It's the next level up where your stuff is encrypted from end to end. Google and the European Euro Union were driving that. And slowly but surely, all of the providers are moving away from SMS to the higher encrypted level. And it is not available in China or Russia. Of course. Ah. Hey, Judy, I thought of my last comment. Let me just say it very quickly. We have Cox and we have TV and telephone and internet from Cox. And a couple of months ago, I realized that I could get rid of my Cox modem, my internet modem, and I could plug my router into the ethernet port on the phone modem. I consolidated and so I got rid of, rid of one device that made things neater and I reduced my electric bill by a tiny smidgen, but it just made my, my cabling a whole lot nicer. And so if you have a phone modem and an ethernet modem, depending on your ISP and your provider, you may be able to combine them and get rid of the standalone modem, use the phone modem for everything. Yep. Uh, my last comment is I have basic TV and one extra tier my VOIP phone, which is $12.99 a month, and my bill is $236 every single month. What provider is that? I live in California. Spectrum. I live in California. Magic Jack is $39 a year. I know it, and it works perfectly. And UMA, yeah. UMA is a O O M A is a fantastic system to use too. So yeah. 
You've got what you got. Anyway, thank you so much for attending. Bill's presentation was fantastic. We have our mind boggled with everything that he told us. You will get a copy of the presentation and you will get uh, everything that is in the chat, the links that people have put in there and things like that.